I'm going to be introducing an aspect of DIY printing and publishing history and its relationship to a particular dimension of alternative left activism in Britain during the 1970s. So that's kind of community printing, community papers, community activism. Um, and it's an area that I'd in encountered in my teens, really. Um, not so much through <coughs> um, direct participation, but it's sort of proximity and overlapped with um, a sort of broader field of radical printing that existed within, within the UK and in many other um, places, places around the world. And um, when about, tw about 12 years ago, something like that, I'd, you know, I'd long since left that area of ra you know, radical printing. I'd gone into teaching and was doing other things. Um, but I decided to do a historical research project looking at that wider field of independent, um, politically driven, radical printing um, collectives in, in the main. And um, while doing that research, it really sort of gave me a chance to find out much more about this particular section of that field called, um, that was known as community printing or self-help printing, it was sometimes known as. And um, I should sort of say something here. It's not really, this isn't really about the duplicator. Um, the duplicator features within it. Um, it, was in, it was important to it, but um, the it didn't centre around the, the duplicator um, as, as such. In fact, some of it was to do with the frustrations of the, of the, of the duplicator, the, the, the limitations of it. Um, so that's, I'm going to be talking a bit about that. But I just sort of firstly want to briefly introduce this other project that I'm involved with now, partly because I want help um, um, a, a bit. And it's, it's, it's quite closely aligned. It's to do with um, the history of radical newspapers, independent, regional, um, radical um, newspapers, which were kind of parallel and much, very much overlapping phenomena with community activism and community um, print shops. And this is a project, I'm afraid I've sort of um, copied and pasted these slides. Uh, um, this is a project that's based at UWE in Bristol, um, and that's the title of it. And it's a collaboration between the history department and the journalism department. And um, I'm the sort of re researcher on it, although I'm, I'm kind of mostly based in London. Um, and this is... This is really what um, it's about, and we're in a sort of scoping phase at the moment of identifying um, as many different titles as possible. I've now come up with 250 titles of these papers that mostly started in the 1970s, some a little bit earlier, um, and where, where they were based, who was involved with them, how long they ran for, and crucially, where they might be archived. Um, you know, lots of stuff was not kept um, in any kind of sort of systematic way. People now are very much kind of digging, you know, into their sort of cellars and under their beds and, you know, people are finding all kinds of things that a new generation is becoming interested in, which is fantastic. But we want to do a kind of systematic study of where, of where things are kept. Um, and we've got, you know, a series of questions that um, uh, are, are driving this. Some of them are kind of questions really to do with kind of our interest in sort of media history. Um, so they're things to do with editorial ethos. Um, they're also to do with the kinds of stories that were covered. Some of these small papers got particular sorts of scoops. Um, the mainstream press wouldn't touch um, because they were in independent. That was something that was quite interesting um, about them. And um, we also interested in doing sort of oral history type stuff, you know, before people die, as many people in this room are aware of. Uh, we are partly on that list as well. Um, so. If anybody knows anything or knows anybody that was involved, um, please um, get in touch. These are some of the sort of initial um, things that we're sort of um, finding out at the moment. So that's about that. This thing about sort of these kinds of newspapers, I'm going to be mentioning again um, briefly, but that's that project. Okay, I'll show that up at, um, at the end again. <coughs> so. 
to sort of to return to the um, issue in hand, community print shops, community uh, papers, um, community activism. Um, community activism was really a kind of really important part of alternative left politics in the 1970s. And some people might say it was one of the defining things about it, um, for, for a period at least. Um, and part of that was very much the production of different kinds of media. It might seem obvious now um, to us, um, but at that time, there's a long, long history of people organizing around local issues. Um, but access to media to sort of amplify those things or to, or to publicize them was not and nothing like a sort of simple um, as, as it is now. So this, that's sort of um, what I want to be looking at. I'm not sure whether in this context it's worth saying something about that word community. Um, it's sort of, it's quite a tricky word. Um, it's, um, you know, it's a contested concept. <laughs> let's say. Um, it's kind of one of those words that people invariably see as good, sort of fuzzy, warm, all right, let's build community, or oh, community, and this kind of warm glow. I think, you know, Raymond Williams wrote about this quite a long um, time ago, but, it, you know, it's generally seen as something sort of positive and desirable. Um, but it's also kind of quite homogenizing, can be quite a homogenizing term as well, um, the community. Um, and also quite exclusionary, who's in and who's out. Um, and we've got all those gruesome terms like community um, breakdown, community cohesion, community resilience, all those sorts of things that are part of kind of, you know, policy um, documents. And, but for parts of the left, it's been quite an import important concept as a basis for organizing. Um, and of course there's problems there too because that old, dis you know, sort of sociological distinction between community and society, um, people have felt quite differently about that. Um, but also it's something, not just as a basis for organising, but as something, as something aspirational as well, that idea of the kind of community to come. Um, so it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of complicated word and it's a term that has been taken up by, you know, uh, politicians right across the spectrum and um, in quite troubling um, ways at all as well. And I think in the context of this particular history, all of these things are, are, are relevant and I'm not going to go much more sort of into that, but there's kind of sort of hints of them, um, uh, you know, apparent with, within this. Um, but I think suffice to sort of say in the sort of 1960s and 1970s, this idea that community um, or communi communities, local populations were a, um, a source of uh, potentiality for, for kind of trouble and uh, for uh, that in the sort of positive way as well for political organizing was something that was certainly in infecting significant parts of the left. Um, so, oh yeah. I should say something about these quotes. So um, the first one, this idea of localism being the new radicalism, this is quite a nice sort of a quote. This is uh, from a guy called um, Charlie, Charlie Rose, who's involved with a community sort of print shop and resource center based in South London, which some of you here will know some, um, something about. Um, and lots of those people had been involved in other kinds of politics, and anti-Vietnam war protests, peace movement, things like that. But somehow this idea of organizing locally where something might be possible to do rather than these huge um, issues um, was, you know, was, was something that's very much um, in the air. And this other quote here is from a guy called Greg Wilkinson who was involved with Swindon Free Press, which was a local radical newspaper set up in Swindon uh, in the early 1970s and like many, many others that were produced across the time. Um, he talks about going to um, Paris in you know, May 68 to see what's going on there. He's a, a Reuters um, journalist uh, re reporting in Algeria. 
but through all of the different kinds of politics that he's around and in, in his sort of profession, there's this kind of sense, again, which is part of perhaps a sort of, kind of structure of sort of feeling, if you, if you like, about people should be able to kind of speak uh, for themselves and therefore setting up things like community newspapers and uh, community print shops was a way of facilitating that. Um, so that's kind of perhaps, you know, a bit of the sort of... Um, bit of the, of the background to do that. And the other thing, um, of course, about the um, difference maybe between this idea of community politics and prevailing politics um, of the time is um, the sort of, you know, the, the subjects and issues um, are, are different. Um, and a lot of those subjects and issues were those excluded by dominant left-wing uh, narratives of revolution at that time. You know, where was the revolution going to come from? Well, it was, you know, from the organized working class in the workplace, or perhaps it's from uh, national liberation struggles in the then called third world. These are very different kinds of subjects of, 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 of history and, and of change. So again, this idea of kind of coming down to the sort of local and the ordinary and these other everyday struggles, uh, which were very much going on to do with housing, police harassment, um, housing, um, you know, um, schooling, play space, thing, things like that. And a lot of these politics were also to do with a kind of critique of the, of the welfare state at the time, which perhaps now, when we kind of think of the state of things now, it's quite, it's quite difficult. And one thing that's often said about community politics is that it started out kind of um, railing against the failures of the welfare state, but it ends up defending it, you know, within quite a short period of time. Um, so, and within all of this, of course, is this rejection of, of, of party politics, party lines, and political hierarchies, um, including those of the sort of so-called revolutionary left. And central to all of this is a notion of self-organization, self-determination, ideas of auton autonomy, those kinds of things. People being able to do things for themselves. And again, some of these I ideas about self-help, if you like, and, and, and DIY, DIY took on another sort of tenor under Thatcherism as well. Um, well, people should, yes, of course, do it for yourselves and help yourselves and pull yourselves up. So, you know, there's lots of Sort of complicated and sort of tricky things about, about some of that, but this is just kind of trying to set a bit of a um, kind of um, context. So it was through um, sort of turn to community activism then that lots of little community print shop, printing workshops began to be autonomously set up by small groups of people across the country. And a number of these were, were known um, as self-help presses. So... Um, and here's a quote from a uh, 1975 edition of one of Jonathan Zeitlin's print, How You Can Do It, by a group um, who came to be known as Islington Community Press. They had various different names to start with. One of them was North One Press. So we see the press as a weapon in a political struggle. Um, we want it to be used by local groups. And this is kind of um, sort of language in here. There's this sort of discourse again about control over our own lives um, <coughs> and fighting against uh, your profit system, that sort of thing. And also in that, there's this idea that the print shop could be a kind of meeting place for people. So it's not about printing for one particular group. It's about this idea that lots of different kinds of groups that might have things in common could um, meet, bump into each other, kind of learn how to do things together. So that idea perhaps of yeah, kind of building some alternative uh, community or creating some of the conditions to help facilitate that was seen to be really important. And the other thing um, that's sort of worth pointing out here is the distinction they make between what they're trying to do and top-down initiatives. Because, you know, as I've just said, community was this term that was kind of captured by different, as it is now, by different political agendas. So at this time there was as well um, lots of concern um, about community breakdown within working class areas in inner cities um, and also in uh, various other places, well, like sort of new towns and so on. And there was money available for small projects 
that would seem to do something to help the community uplift itself. You could get a bit of money for a duplicator, for a typewriter, um, if it fit one of these um, genders. And lots of these groups did, did do that, in fact. Um, and, you know, well, it's like anybody that does application forms now. I mean, you, you know, you write it to meet the you know, funders' uh, criteria so you can use it for your own um, purposes. So there was this around... Um, and some of these, I mean, this is sort of much bigger history, but some of this came out of a series of reports, policy reports that were done in the 1960s that realised, oh, right, poverty is still here, actually. The welfare state hasn't solved that. Um, something needs to be done. There's kind of problems with schools. There's problems with this, that, and the other. So there were these, there was these things around. Lots of people wanted to get their hands um, on this. But this also created opportunities um, for getting uh, perhaps money, but also getting space as well. Um, London was filled, as were many other um, cities with dilapidated buildings, um, often council-owned, where things could happen, things, things, could, be, um, things could be done. Um, so one of the perhaps sort of first self-styled um, community print shops was somewhere called Notting Hill Press which set up in 1968. This was started by two nurses who abandoned their training in Ireland who came over to London to um, join the revolution. And for them, where the revolution was to be had was in Notting Hill Gate and around community activism. And there was a very diverse um, kinds of uh, things that might come under the banner of community activism in that area at that time. Quite a lot of different players coming from different political perspectives, a fair amount of um, antagonism, I think, um, but also a lot, um, a lot happening. And um, these women were, got, got involved with some of that, and there were lots of different groups. There was a sort of network of, of groups as well, organizing around different things. Um, housing, claimants unions, um, police, um, issues around the police, issues around play space, those, those sorts of things. And they went around to these groups and said, oh, do, you, do you want a newspaper? We, you know, we want to do something. We want to, you know, we want to do something. And they said, what we really, really need is a printing press. You know, we, all we've got access to is a rubbish duplicator. <laughs> um, and it's not sufficient. For our, um, for our needs. Yes, we can do certain things, but we, we need a printing press of, of, of our own. And um, so they found a printing press that was, um, it actually had a nice history to it. It was stashed in, the, in a basement secretly. It had been used to print um, fake dollar bills criticizing the um, Vietnam War and the um, owner of the press, I think, had been uh, arrested. Um, he's somebody who'd be known to some uh, people in this room. So the press had gone into hiding. Some peace activists had sort of hidden it under blankets and it got hauled out again to be the press for Notting Hill Press. They went on a two-week um, training course at Rota Print, who had a sort of factory, I think, in West London, and learned how to use it. And then this printing press sort of became a hub, really, for different kinds of local um, activities and, and, and printing things. The press was owned by um, about four different groups. They met, started, did all this kind of legal stuff, so they owned no assets themselves. So should the inevitable come, um, you know, financial uh, collapse or getting done for printing something contentious, then there was nothing that could be taken away. And that did happen on a couple of occasions, and the press was kind of reborn under other names. Um, things that were printed there were um, a whole kind of range of things. A paper was set up, People's News, that reported on the different activities of local groups, but they also printed things like The Hustler, which was a local black radical paper. They th printed things for the new um, you know, Portobello cinema that was coming up. They printed things for you know, uh, dustbin men uh, striking. They printed you know, a whole um, host of things, and different uh, people came in. And they learned how to do the sort of, some of the basics. They didn't learn how to use the Offset Litho Press, um, but they learned how to do artwork and, um, and stuff like that, um, sort of pre, um, the pre-press um, 
sort of thing. And the press was such an unusual resource that they had community activist groups traveling from across the country to come down and use it to print their local papers. So they had uh, people from Moss Side coming down to use it, they had people coming down from Wales to use it, different parts of the country. And then some of those groups then went with help from Notting Hill Press, went and set up their own little LIFO press that then became similar kinds of um, resources. So <coughs> it's quite, um, quite a sort of um, interesting setup. In the early 1970s, um, the press was taken over by a different group of people. It was reborn um, as Crest Press. Um, this group produced a different paper, um, which I haven't got an image of, um, unfortunately, Ned um, Nailgate. And this is their um, logo here, these sort of dungareed uh, militants. Uh, if you don't hit it, it won't fall. And it signaled a more kind of explicitly uh, radical agenda um, for the press. And different kinds of people were now, com now coming in and using it. So um, the Gay Liberation Front, who'd had great difficulties getting their paper printed, unsurprisingly. They'd been using the Socialist Worker Press. Um, which charged them commercial rates because they didn't see what they were doing as political, whereas other left groups got, you know, a kind of non-commercial non rate. They discovered Crest Press, who said, you know, come on in, we'll uh, show you how to do it. Some of those people stayed involved with that um, press for quite a while. Um, they more kind of sort of women's movement stuff that was emerging was uh, printed there. People associated with a, a lot of continua were going in and using things. Um, so it's kind of different setup, a bit more chaotic, perhaps less embedded in some of the um, other kinds of local activism, um, but still, um, still kind of important and different sorts of networks. Um, they were connected into different sorts of um, networks. Um, so what Crest also did was um, develop a, print, a, a sort of print it yourself um, ethos. Um, so it wasn't just people doing their own artwork and um, sort of, you know, negatives and things like that. It was like, well, if you want to come and print something here, we're not actually going to do it for you. We're not going to service you in that way. You can learn how to do it yourself. Um, and that thing was something, that idea was starting to spread across these other little uh, print shops that were, that were starting up across the country. So um, this is... Um, couple of, um, one of these, this thing are self-help printers. This is a page in one of those Jonathan Zeeland um, uh, publications. Um, he was a real uh, proselytizer for this idea of self-help um, printing or, or printing it yourself. Um, say a bit more about that in a minute. Um, so here we've got a thing from Crest. There's a meeting, uh, you know, once a week where we decide what we get, what we're going to be printing. This idea of having a weekly meeting where people can come along and say, look, this is really important, this needs printing um, to be discussed. Um, this was something that happened in some of the other small community print shops as well. Islington Community Press used to do that to start with too. Um, and people would have to you know, learn or help out how to do it. And it was quite interesting, the philosophy behind this, um, partly it was that thing to, you know, we should learn how to be able to make our own media and we need to learn as many different tools as we can. But again, it's also about the idea of not servicing, um, about different kind of social relationship may maybe. Um, Jonathan Zetlin, he produced a number of these books. Um, I don't know how influential they were in terms of this thing that was already happening. Um, but I think they were considered to be useful things for sure. And it's really interesting looking at them from the first edition, which was actually in 1974 through to the later ones. In the, I think the latest one was in the sort of early 90s, which he ends up with, you know, the DIY thing has been taken over. Um, it's now become commercialized. Desktop publishing's arrived. And now it's become a thing that people just do on their own. And, you know, he sort of... So he was, but they're good, they're interesting to, to look at them together and they also give you a sense of the different groups and things that, that, were, um, that were setting up. So <coughs> the community newspaper 
was often, in fact, a motivation for setting up one of these little um, print shops. People wanted to produce a paper to report on things that were going on, to act as a campaigning device, um, to encourage people and themselves to um, say, report on what was happening. Um, and so sometimes the, the sort of a print shop came out of that, or sometimes a print shop was set up, and it became somewhere that lots of groups could go to and print their little, you know, and some of these were hyper-local uh, publications as well, print their little um, local ma magazine. And <coughs> beyond, I think, beyond providing a sort of printing resource, what's quite interesting about these places was how many of them became quite important sorts of nodes within a wider alternative infrastructure, um, both sort of materially and socially. I mean, Islington Community Press, for example, it became established as a production hub for newspaper. Um, and of course, you've got all the things that are being reported on within that. There was a squatters advice center there. There was kind of various kind of nursery campaigns. They had meeting space. Um, because lots of them were try getting hold of buildings that were available that lots of other things could, could happen within. Um, and again, this is part of the sort of, you know, sort of conditions of urban space at that time. But I think the involvement with the newspaper as well and that co close relationship meant um, a strong sense of, of things, that were, things that were going on and becoming a contact point. But also they were used by all sorts of other left-wing groups as, as well. Um, I mean, um, Jeff Holland, who was involved with it, I mean, he was sort of telling me it's like every sort of left-wing group under the sun kind of wanted to come and uh, use us. So you had that kind of mix of, you know, kind of broader mix of things as well. And I suppose in a way this was sort of, kind of all sort of grist to the, you know, alternative left mill really, and that idea of building, how you might sort of build a kind of active um, community. These are just some, some very, very many different papers. And other places performed quite similar functions, although in, in different ways. There was Union Place in um, South London, um, who they were, got very much involved in instigating local campaigns as well. And um, they had a food co-op. They were involved in adventure playgrounds. They did all different kinds of sorts of um, pro projects, um, if you like. And they saw the, the center as very much a kind of base of operation to cause trouble, um, you know, really, to kind of uh, stir things up and um, also to provide the sort of communication resources for, for people to be able to sort of um, spread the word, bring other people in. And a big part of what lots of these uh, groups were doing, were they were in struggle with the local authorities, with the local councils. Um, I think that might be my last um, slide. So what happened to all of this? Um, well, these sort of aspirations for it, these alternative left aspirations for this, this kind of local activism faded after a few years. Too many battles um, were lost. Um, that kind of uprising that was maybe, uh, you know, hoped to happen wasn't, uh, wasn't happening. Um, and, you know, as I've just said, the kind of, that idea of kind of critiquing the, you know, welfare state and all its sort of uh, failures, people quite quickly in a position of, of having to um, defend that. But other things really, this sort of DIY principle um, became to be sort of quite sorely tested. Um, offset litho presses, which was a kind of, you know, the mainstay thing, except for those places that were doing you know, screen printing and poster making, but even then, in fact, there were, there were issues with DIY. It's not such a sort of democratic machine as the, perhaps the, the duplicator, never mind the photocopier. Um, so, and the photocopy was becoming much more widely accessible. Um, more people had them. There was the instant print shop where maybe you could go and get your sort of little thing done. People weren't getting those sorts of things. Um, Lots of places gave up this idea of people kind of printing it for them, um, for themselves. Um, but there was still plenty of other material around to some extent that was, you know, that, that, that was feeding these places. But that kind of locally stuff really began to sort of, really began to dry up. And so lots of them really 
became sort of jobbing printers, maybe became sort of printing cooperatives, that kind of thing. And then they were in competition with sort of other, perhaps more together, um, printing co-ops. And really, they kind of, I think, you know, money had never been a driver for most of these places. So it was sort of what was the purpose to carry on? Spatial conditions also became much more difficult um, as, you know, sort of regeneration and urban development, those sorts of things. So they really, for the most part, kind of disappeared by the sort of mid-1980s. Um, so what I want to do is I sort of want to leave it there. And if there's any kind of questions about any of that, any uh, corrections, um, anything, then I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jess Baines. <laughs> do you have any questions for Jess? Yeah. Um, less a question than a sort of addition. Um, I don't know about a lot of these pla places, of course, but Islington Gutter Press I do know, did know very well. Um, the reason why it was physically possible was because there was a huge expansion of the squatting movement yeah. um, after a rather successful struggle in 1972. Yeah. And opening up 11 Hemingford Road was one of the, it was one of the first squats that opened up after we had won our sort of victory um, a little bit further north. Um, and I think that was very important because obviously you weren't paying rent. Yeah. Um, you did tend to pay rates though. Yeah. Um, and obviously bills, um, and I imagine that that was a factor for a number of, other, of the other people's presses and so on. Um, it was, there was the peppercorn rent, this idea as well, wasn't it? So, I mean, I didn't say enough because I couldn't actually read no, no, my no, notes. No, 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 I'm just, but, I'm yeah, just throwing but, yeah, in a bit. But no, no say, tell me more. Um, well, short life licensing yes. as well, um, which was another result of our squatting struggle in Islington. They'd had masses and masses of empty houses because they were all being vacated, people were being, being decanted and they yeah. were then all going to be pulled down and something better built, um, etc. Not, not, I think, in Hemingford Road. I don't think they were... Well, of course, Hemingford Road did get pulled down. Yeah. We have Barnard Park. Um, and just a sort of thing about the difficulty if you don't have any printing training. Um, speaking as someone who did use the... Um, <laughs> the gutter press press to print a poetry pamphlet on. Um, half a day's training on an AB dick is not quite enough to keep you out of trouble. Yeah. Um, we did struggle through, but it was very hard work compared to running a Gustetna. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I see most of the newsletters have a cover price on them. Was that to actually successfully recover their costs, or was it to know people would value the thing rather than just take and throw them away? Uh, cover costs. And did, was that successful? Were these things run cost neutral, or did they run at a loss? <laughs> well, I mean, the labour depends what you mean by loss. So if the labour was free, um, it's whether they cover, cover the costs of the paper. Ways that people got paper uh, to do things, um, you know, you could get deals, you could do this, that, and the other. Um, but yeah, I mean, mostly things made a loss, I would say. Yeah. Um, part of the reason for um, having a printing press was also a way of supporting newspapers by taking on other work that you might not make a loss on or you know you might make a tiny sort of profit on but of course bear in mind there's very minimal or no labor costs involved in that so but yeah it's a good question thank you i remember those days um one one thing i would add is that there were vicious political disputes within all these papers uh, particularly between yes. anarchists and uh, shall we say more left-wing more traditional left-wing uh, people and, and they often uh, were, were infiltrated by complete opportunists as well, uh, as was squatting itself. Um, the, the other thing was that some, some groups became professionalized. I mean, I belonged to yes. a, a, yeah. a group called uh, Jay Bellas, which later became Calvert's North Star. And as it became professionalized, there were very, very vicious personal disputes within it, which could have closed them down. Uh, but uh, actually, Calvert's North Star did, did survive and prosper. No thanks to me, by the way. Yeah. Were, were you there 
You were involved in Bellas? Ah, oh, okay, I must talk to you afterwards. I used to work at Calvert's. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Jim, come on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I just wanted to plug in the um, fact that um, the Arts Lab were, ran an open yes. access press yeah. sort of like mid 60s through certainly to 1970, um, which was a kind of precursor to the, the community yeah. access. Yeah. They had an AB deck, didn't last long because they didn't give enough training. The gripper bars kept breaking yeah. and things like a pick would feed the paper yeah. through wrong. And yeah. So that's, yeah. What, that's what happened to the Arts Lab press. Yeah, um, so who was it that was running that? Well, Hoppy um, Hopkins had a, had a line on it. When I used it, it was in, they had, I used it once when they, they had the premises in um, the Roberts, Roberts Road up from um, Tottenham Court Road. There was a bloke called Collins, John Collins. Right. Yeah, John Collins. And then yeah. they had the premises in the um, Prince, of Wales, cr Prince of Wales Crescent, I think, or Prince of Wales Terrace. That which has been knocked down. And there, Hoppy, John Hopkins was, yeah. said, look, there's the press, <laughs> there's the plates. This is how you make a plate. This is yeah. how you print it. We didn't break the machine. Okay, yeah. I'm telling you that. Yeah, no, but I think, broken. yeah, that's the other thing about amateurs, um, you know, being on these machines and not really knowing how to use them. And they're already knackered. Let's face it. I mean, nobody had a new offset press. It was already something that was tired and a bit tricky. And um, so, yeah. Um, okay. I just have a quick question, actually. Yeah. Um, I was wondering how you felt DIY publishing existed today, if you felt it existed, and, and if so, in what form it takes? Oh, I mean, it massively exists, doesn't it? I mean, it's all over the, I mean, it's all over the place, isn't it? I mean, it's, people are doing a vast amount of DIY publishing, um, that, and that's, you know, using various kind of, you know, sort of internet type tools or I don't know, Lulu stuff or things, you know, print on demand things as well as all the kind of printed stuff, actual, you know, sort of people wanting to make little publications and things like that. I mean, it seems like there's as much as it of it in almost as there ever was. It's maybe different kinds of things and I think there's a different I mean it's always interesting to see political stuff that's printed now. Um, and I think I was quite confused about that for a while. I was thinking, well, why on earth would you do that? It's so much easier to just find things on, online, um, really. But then it isn't always so easy to find them online. And I guess there's, again, that idea of handing something, having something, that material um, culture stuff. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's loads of it. But I think it's, it's, it's coming from a different place, isn't it? Because, I mean, that print was what you had. It was the... It was the most accessible means of communication. So it, it wasn't, you know, and I don't think there's, you know, a lot of these things aren't very artful either. I think uh, somebody was saying it before. It's like the sort of carefulness and the kind of, I think Teal was saying it, you know, now with people producing zines and the kind of much more consciousness of visual languages and things and who it is that, that's, that's doing them. I mean, there's so much more sophistication in a way. I don't know if the politics have, have moved on massively, <laughs> you, know, in terms, you know, maybe they have, but it's sort of, yeah, I think that there's a whole different thing that's being, being brought to it, much more appreciation of, of, of process um, in, you know, in, in lots of ways. Um, but I guess you have to do that because you're making a conscious choice to do a printed thing rather than we want to get this stuff out there, uh, we need to print it. So I think it's... Yeah. So one last question yeah. over here at the front. Thanks very much. Um, I, yeah, I'm not that, that aware of the time, personally. But um, I have a question. How did you get on with, um, how did amateur printers and how did uh, these radical presses get on with print unions? Were there any interaction or is there? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, how did they feel? Yeah. Well. These smaller places, the, um, lots of the very kind of tiny ones, um, weren't necessarily unionised, but there was a sort of bit of ambivalent relationship in many ways because 
printing unions were part of the system, right? So, and particularly printing unions because they were seen as quite exclusionary. Um, you know, it's all men and uh, sort of nepotism and things like that, particularly kind of Fleet Street. So, but on the other hand, people wanted to, particularly as sort of time went on, kind of you know, particularly sort of Thatcher, people also wanted to show solidarity. And there were things like whopping dispute in the late 80s, this is much later on, where, you know, I mean, many of us that were involved in these things went down, even if you thought, you know, they were wankers. It was still, actually, you still, there's still this principle um, there, which, you know, in the face of everything else. Um, and also, to be unionised, you had to pay a certain rate of pay. So, I mean, there were ways around it that people found. Um, so lots of the presses actually did, were, did become unionised um, or wanted, you know, they wanted to have TU after the name. But this particularly became a thing for sort of more the kind of, um, you know, the printing co-ops that were actually trying to make a reasonable living out of it um, and, you know, operate in a cooperative way and for, you know, politically sort of reasonable um, um, sort of group, groups, so yeah, I mean there was, but but also the thing if you you are if you are a cooperative or collectively run, what's the function of the union? If the function of the union is to negotiate, you know, with management, so then what what's its role? Well, actually, it becomes solidarity with the wider union movement, but also it becomes slightly uh, strategic in that you want unions to come and use you and you need to be a union press for unions to come and use you. You need that TU stamp. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Jim could probably say some interesting things about that. The, there was this kind of st structural <laughs> dissonance between yes. being a printing cooperative uh, and, and having open access presses yes. to trade union printing, especially when the unions were the ones who were running apprenticeship schemes, which yeah. goes completely against the grain of having complete access yeah. to, to machinery. And whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. Well, you don't have hardly any apprenticeships now. Um, but yeah, that was the biggest thing. Well, and the unions screwed themselves up because it took them ages uh, to actually form um, I think it was Nalgo, one of them, actually had a small offset division, union, yeah. small offset division. And this is like some 10 or 15 years after the small offset had entered the thing. Yeah. They just did not bother to unionize within the office printing environment yeah. because they didn't see that as didn't being one. Didn't see it part of the printing trade. Yeah, it was one part, part of the trade, yeah. yeah. So um, they, they screwed themselves that's up. That's sort of, I think the thing that Jim's saying there, this thing about skill, was also a big tension because if you think something like printing, you know, it's kind of a sort of aristocracy of the working class, you know, it's kind of highly skilled um, labour who had in certain sections of it have got, had got very good sort of money and conditions and it's like, you know, if I was to get, meet someone to say, oh, well, yeah, I'm a printer, like, and they'd be like, you know, you're all right, I'm saying, yeah, if only you knew. But it's sort of, so that thing as well about protecting skills and those skills being recognised, as Jim's sort of saying, this idea of the community press and self-help press, oh, anyone can do it, printing is easy, you just kind of come and learn how to do it. Well, it's devaluing that too. So it's definitely, um, yeah, thanks, Jim, I forgot about that tension. <coughs> but the, the, that. The, the, another aspect of it, though, was that the, if you, um, the, the the protectionism that the trade unions had, this yeah, kind of yeah, mysteries of the print yeah. that went on. Yeah. Uh, we were quite successful because we let people come in and see how it, we didn't let them do it. We, yeah. They could see, and it, that kind of, you got a lot more feedback. If, when people knew how something was done, they could then begin to see how they could develop what they wanted to do. Yeah. Um, it was, yeah. Yeah, that bit was good. I fun, mean, there's, yeah, there's all, you know, I'm sure me and Jim could talk to you another time. There's lots more for it, but I think there's probably um, time for some science fiction. <laughs> Is that right? It's a great little interlude. Yeah, there's yeah. always time for a bit of science fiction. Yeah. Uh, so thank yeah. you very much, uh, right. Jess. Okay. Thanks. Thank you.